are there maps that have the location of the settlement there or? Oh no, this was a tremendous set of, of challenges. Uh, when Vicki Oldham created the Looking for Angola research team, we had uh, Cantor Brown Jr. provided the archival information that said they were, they were on the Manatee River strewn out to Sarasota Bay, which is a fairly large area. And the Manatee River itself is a, a fairly long river. Most of it's covered these days by urban sprawl of Bradenton. So it was a real set of uh, challenges. Hi, welcome everyone to Archaeology Arcade, the online program of the Florida Public Archaeology Network, where we play video games as well as explore different virtual landscapes with archaeologists. Uh, I'm Mike out of FPAN's Coordinating Center, which is located in downtown Pensacola. As always, I'm joined by my colleague, Tristan, who is in our uh, office in Tallahassee for our North Central region. And today we have two special guests with us. Uh, first, Diana gonzalez Tennant, who is the owner and project manager of Digital Heritage Interactive. And we're once again welcoming back Dr. Uzi Baram, professor of anthropology at New College of Florida in the wonderful city of Sarasota. I love Sarasota, it's such a great place. Uh, how, how are you three doing? Doing well, great. doing well, thank you. Great, well, it's great to, to have you two on. And today, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore these, these two different virtual landscapes uh, that Diana and Uzi that you, you created uh, several years ago. I believe you said 2016 is when this was, uh, this was made available, but Tragedy and Survival, which are two virtual landscapes of maroon communities that uh, existed in uh, Florida, in the Apalachicola area, and then in Sarasota. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend about the first half looking at um, the first one, which is Prospect Bluff, and then we'll move uh, about halfway through talk about Angola, and we're hoping to kind of wrap up uh, Kazuzi has some information to tell us about some excavations that took place at the site of Angola. Uh, you said last year, is that correct? Last Uzi? January. Last yeah, January. The pandemic, yeah. we got in some. Wow, that's yeah, like, what a what a difference a, a year makes, right? Yeah. It's, it's pretty. Um, but let me let me first. Can can you? I have you two introduce yourselves. Let's start with Diana. Can you tell me a little bit about your background, and then you, can you tell me about um, Digital uh, Heritage Interactive? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I actually opened up Digital Heritage Interactive with my husband. Uh, it existed in like a different form in the state of New Jersey. And then we moved to Florida. And that's really when Digital Heritage Interactive became what it is today. Um, so I started off really just kind of tinkering. Um, my first field school was at Kingsley Plantation in Jacksonville, Florida. And I just started modeling the structures there for kind of for fun because I thought it would be interesting, um, especially the structures that we were finding that weren't really standing anymore. Um, and then that model actually became part of Google Earth, um, like part of the buildings layer. I'm not sure if it exists anymore, but um, yeah. And then that was used as like part of a play at the University of Florida. So I just kind of got interested in it and started yeah. doing more projects. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Kingsley Plantation, for, for the folks who don't know, is on, I believe, on St. George Island in the That's northeast right. uh, side of the state of Florida. It's an incredible site. Um, I've, I've been there once. We Actually, right before the pandemic, I, we met some uh, tourism fish, officials from Barbados and Jamaica that came down to St. Augustine because they were really interested in learning about how heritage tourism is done in Florida because so those islands are trying to move away from the big cruise ships, and they're starting to focus on uh, heritage tourism and so they wanted to see how how uh kind of the gold standard of interpretation for similar sites that they might have in the uh, caribbean and so the one of the stops was kingsley so it's such a, so um so you said that you had just started modeling is that something that you just got interested in that you've always been interested because my understanding is there's not a huge number and this may be like a stereotype that's that's just totally wrong. But my understanding is that there's not a huge number of uh, women in the field of, uh, you know, developing of, of video games and virtual landscapes. Uh, how did you get involved? And is that even true? Am I just totally following the stereotype that's wrong? I mean, there's, there's probably a few, and I think there's a growing number of women doing archaeological visualization, essentially. Um, but I, I couldn't give you an actual number. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, let's. Well, yeah, I mean, again, I could be, I could be totally off with that. <laughs> but, uh, but so, so you is just something that you were just always, always interested. Like what, it, you know, you mentioned just uh, with just with Kingsley. So, did you have like before then, or it was just that's kind of how it it started? I mean, I'm, I think I've always had an interest in it. It sounds kind of cheesy, I know, but like I'd watch the documentaries as a kid on, you know, PBS and be like, I want to model archaeological sites. That's so cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, I mean, it just kind of happened, though, um, when I was an undergrad. Great. Just yeah. kind of did it. Yeah, well, it's it's such a cool project and uh, and product, and uh, I'm looking forward to to looking at this. So, Tristan, let's go ahead and start the Prospect yep. Bluff one, and then Uzi, can you kind of give us some context for th how this tragedy and survival uh, virtual landscape started, and then what what are we looking at in terms of the history and archaeology of the site? Wonderful. Yeah, no, I'm really excited that you're showing this because I think this is a really neat reconstruction that Ben was able to construct for us. Uh, this started uh, years ago, actually, almost a decade and a half ago, when Vicki Oldham, a community scholar out of uh, Sarasota, wanted to include what was really obscure historical uh, background for the region of Sarasota, Manatee. Uh, there was just one scholarly article about a maroon community, then referred to as an escaped slave community of Angola on the Manatee River. And she asked me to join an interdisciplinary research team to look for and find material remains of this early 19th century community. I, I was enthusiastic about the opportunity and we engaged in a whole series of public outreach events. Uh, we did archival research and connected with descendant communities in the Bahamas and of course did some archeological work. And it just was really animating for my career. It fit exactly my goals as an archeologist, as an anthropologist. Uh, to follow through on confronting the silences of the past, to really reveal what had happened in what essentially was my backyard, uh, not far from New College of Florida in Bradenton. Well, we were moving forward, got a lot of success in 2014, we were able to note uh, finds of Angola by the Manatee Mineral Spring. And I was really pleased with that finding, I uh, got some good attention, uh, but then I realized we had an anniversary coming up. And one of the imperatives I've always held to is that we should remember anniversaries, uh, not just on a personal level, but in terms of uh, major events. And to understand Angola and the Manatee River I had to go back to the Apalachicola River, to this place that we're walking around right now, Prospect Bluff, where in 1814, British soldiers helped engineer a gigantic fort for Maroons and Native Americans. This was during the War of 1812. It's an amazingly complicated history, but it's all part of Florida having been a haven of freedom for people who were self-emancipated from enslavement. We know from the historical record that this fort ended up housing about 500 people with hundreds more up and down the Apalachicola River, both Native Americans and people of African descent all fighting for their freedom. And we know that in July 1816, the US Navy entered Spanish territory, sailed up the Apalachicola River, and in what is described as a lucky shot, blew up this fort, killing 300 people, capturing another couple of hundred people, and then this is the survival part of the title, others escaped, and they escaped first to the Swanee, and then ultimately to Angola. Well, I kept on looking at that date of July uh, 1816 and was wondering, is anyone gonna acknowledge the 200th anniversary of the destruction of this fort? It's tragedy. And I was looking, asking my colleagues, no one seemed to have uh, made plans. And so I started pulling together a Florida Humanities Council grant. I contacted Diana and her husband, Ed, uh, my other colleagues, of course, Vicki Oldham, Rosin Howard, and uh, Terry Week, and asked if they'd be interested in trying to do some kind of commemoration. I actually assumed that someone else was going to step in and do something, but I thought, it, well, I might as well try. So we applied for a major grant, and knowing what uh, digital heritage interaction does, I thought, well, how about we do a digital reconstruction? And that really was the extent of my thinking. 
I don't want to pretend there was a lot more depth to it. Luckily, Diana and Ed are just the easiest people in the world to work with. Uh, they immediately saw the potential of the project. And thanks to funding from the Florida Humanities Council, we're able to create what we're walking around right now. We took the extant archaeological and historical information. Uh, they looked, Diana and Ed looked at the LIDAR information. So we had the outline of the fort. And using what I could just refer to as the archaeological imagination, built up what we think it looked like. And that's what we're walking around right now. You saw the British flag. Uh, the American forces noticed the Union Jack as well as the red flag. Right? This was a fort meant to fight against slavery. This was not a passive place. Uh, these people at the fort were trained by the British to be soldiers. In fact, they were promised that if they fought with the British, they would be British subjects and would be able to live in freedom in British lands. Yeah, so it's such an incredible story and sight. And then I, I want to ask Diana, but before before I ask Diana, kind of, kind of her perspective on this particular project and how you created this, you mentioned the flag. So of course, the Union Jack is a British flag, and you mentioned the red flag. What did the red flag mean? This was a, a place of war. They were looking to confront the Americans. Right. Yeah. That's that's and, incredible. Yeah. You know, I think you know when I first read about this place. Uh, and there's a lot of scholarship on Prospect Bluff. It was a major incident. Uh, the destruction of all those lives was noted. Uh, the US Navy was operating in Spanish territory uh, without any permission from the Spanish crown. And so Congress investigated why Andrew Jackson sent the Navy into this place. Uh, there's a lot, it was a diplomatic fiasco. Uh, historians wrote about uh, this place, they refer to it, and I excuse the language, but it, it's helpful for finding the scholarship. It's archaic language is referred to in American uh, uh, archives as the Negro Fort. Mm -hmm. And there's several studies. The last major excavation was done in the late 1960s. There was some work done after Hurricane Michael with uh, all the trees that had fallen. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a, a lot of material but it was only as digital heritage interaction was building this that what we see now comes really clear this was large yeah that really comes off in walking around this when you visit the site today of course none of these structures are here i mean what you see in the landscape is of course the trees and the, the vegetation and, and some some of the earthen um what's left of the earthen remnants so this is such a useful way of seeing the size of it. And now, Diana, I wanted to ask you, so Uzi talked about, he contacted you. So what, what did you say after he said, hey, can you do this for me? Were you like, uh, was yeah. it like a huge project or was it something that you knew right away? Yeah, we could knock this right out. Um, well, it was, it was a large project, but definitely one that we were very interested in. Um, my training and my husband's training, and he's done all kinds of work that I'm gonna short shrift talking about it right now, but um, is in African-American archeology. span So this is, very interesting to us. And I love the idea of representing and interpreting these marginalized histories um, that like for p everyone to see, I mean, I want the public to see these sort of things. And like when you travel to the actual location, uh, we went there before actually starting the project. It's a little deceptive. It seems kind of confined because of the tree line. And, you know, if you aren't an archeologist, it won't be obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so really once you get the LIDAR and you start we started building this thing it was it was really incredible and so how did you mention the lidar can you explain what that is exactly so lidar is basically a 3d data set that is collected by satellites and it can be broken down into like the tree layer and then you can just find the ground layer and you actually see topography in the landscape so actually on my website i have a a little segment on this project and it shows the lidar there you can very clearly see like the earthworks that had to go into building this which right. isn't obvious when you're walking around it's really yeah cool. that's, i know exactly what you mean i've been to the site a few times and i, I do want to mention too we have uh, on our stream chat if anybody's i know there's a few folks watching us right now if you have any questions or comments please let us know we actually do have a comment from professor biglow he said i did not realize you guys you folks got this vr walkthrough out there excellent Uzi and Diana and Ed from Brad. So 
Uh, so good. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're learning about it. It's such a cool resource to have. And so um, and going back. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Izzy. Who you are right now? This is the. This is a reason for the tragedy. So in the center of the fort is this magazine, where there was all the gunpowder. And that's what's represented wow. here. If you back up a little bit, right? So we know the British supplied massive amounts of arms. I mean, really, again, it was so easy to when I was just reading about it before we did this, to think small. Now this large, right? They had cannons were brought via the Apalachicola River, mm -hmm. uh, tremendous amounts of gunpowder and uh, hundreds of rifles. When the US Navy ship sent a hot uh, cannonball in, it hit in this magazine. And this is the reason the fort uh, exploded. Yeah. And and one thing I'm noticing about the magazine, too, if you look at the the walls are obviously uh, wood, but the magazine does not look like it's all wood. Do we know what material it was actually made out of? And then do we know archaeologically, has that particular spot been excavated? Uh, it was excavated, I think it was 1969. And so the actual place for the Oxy Oxygon is known. And hmm. it's actually marked at the place. We might actually want to mention, because you, you mentioned going there, and the first time, and Diane mentioned as well, the first time I went there, uh, I brought my kids who were much younger then. Uh, it was a pretty difficult drive to get to this place. It's pretty far in the nat nat natural, natural forest. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably you know, another reason for doing this work. Uh, I think it would be very hard for most people to get to this place. That's yeah. very true. Yeah, and I, I don't even know. I know for a while they, they had closed uh, the the gate to the road and that may have changed because I think that was the last time I went was not too long after Hurricane Michael and like you, you had mentioned there was uh, archaeology there but it's because the many of the trees were actually uprooted and so my understanding is that they were actually going through the, the, the root mats to see if they could and I guess they actually did find artifacts and, and the actual root mats are ripped out so yeah I'm not sure if it is a place that you can you can even get to right now although it, it may be back open but Nonetheless, it's great to have. And then we have another comment from Barbara. She says it's so cool to see the visual of what the magazine would have looked like. Uh, that just goes to proving your point about how important virtual landscapes like this are. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, we, Dan, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. We have uh, the rings from barrels. Oh, okay, from, from the those excavations. Previous, those previous excavations. So the, the shot, the gunshots, uh, the barrels, the rifles, uh, some of that. And it's actually on display at the park. So right, yeah. both published, but also on display. And so much of the individual things you're seeing comes from photos I provided to Digital Heritage Interaction. Wow. It's, it's such a cool, cool first landscape. Now, Diana, um, can you talk to us a little about, about what, what program do you use to create environments like this? So um, a lot of my perspective has been to use like free and open source software to make these things more accessible to these smaller hidden histories. I don't, I'm, yeah. But um, I use Blender 3D, which is a free and open source 3D modeling software. Um, and then I use it, like compile it all together to create the actual game in Unity, which isn't free um, unless you make a certain amount, but it's, it's generally free to use. Um, you can add scripts and do all kinds of stuff. So Blender and Unity. And is this this is the same software that people use to develop uh, like just video games? Is that right? Absolutely, yes. Um, Unity, for the most part, has been used for like indie games, and people have said that it's not as good, but it's definitely kind of growing into its own for sure. Mm -hmm. And now, is this something that people can just kind of pick up learning how to do, or or do you have to take classes to to learn this software, or or how did you, how did you go about that? Oh goodness, it was kind of just try to do it and figure it out the hard way. <laughs> um, I wouldn't recommend that. I would definitely recommend there's all kinds of free resources online to, to learn how to model in Blender, but also, you know, use Unity as well. Right. And I, and so if someone wanted, someone could get a degree in this, I mean, this would be, what, what would this be degree wise? Would it be computer software or is there some other term for it? Oh goodness. Um, I know that there's actual game design degrees. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure if there's one related to archaeology, except maybe through the uh, digital archaeology programs. Right. Yeah. Was well, any any of the universities out there with archaeology program 
if they're listening, they should they should definitely look at creating <laughs> something. Maybe work with their your computer science department. I think there's some in, you know interesting uh, intersections between uh, the the different departments and what you can do with this multidisciplinary um, learning in terms of computer programming. I know is big for for younger kids now, especially uh, the, the out of libraries and stuff with like Minecraft and Roblox and getting kids early engaged in. Um, computer uh, coding and design and this would be another way that maybe archaeology education can sort of creep in to another discipline uh, but this is such a cool cool resource now Uzi you had mentioned um, we're, we're about 10 minutes until we're halfway through our point and so I know we wanted to kind of transition to Angola now you mentioned after the fort destroyed uh, that you know what can you go into more detail about what happened after that yeah. magazine exploded although i do want to note because i think it's just great to mention I, you notice the reflection in the water the shadows uh the work they did is so wonderfully detailed that it's easy to forget they actually had to program all these things right yeah. right none of this just kind of happened i i'm always impressed like the shadow there with the huts you can see the reflection of the flags in the water. It's uh, really uh, awesome work that they produced. Uh, and so, yeah, we have that sense of this really big place, right? And it's uh, it's a more complicated history, but it's supposed to be, right? As part of a uh, commitment to anti-racism, it's to actually show the strength of the rebellion against slavery. Uh, with good reason, Andrew Jackson was concerned about this haven of freedom. This was a real threat to the slave regime and so the U.S. he sent the forces in to destroy it, and you know, that was successful. But the story doesn't end there. Although 300 died and a couple of hundred were captured, others escaped, and we know they escaped. Most of them to Swanee. Some went down to Tampa Bay to Angola, but most went by land down to Swanee, where Billy Bowlegs, the great leader of the Seminole people, had a village, and hundreds came to the Swanee settlement. Uh, that's being excavated now, it's on private property. And that work is being done in conjunction with the Seminole tribe of Florida. But Andrew Jackson wanted to capture these people. He wanted to prevent uh, a group of trained British soldiers from finding respites. And what is known as the Battle of Swanee in 1818, uh, Andrew Jackson took the Tennessee volunteers down to Swanee and the report, uh, military reports are quite clear. What's referred to as black warriors held off the US forces and oh. people escaped southward. After they escaped, uh, the US forces destroyed the villages, just burned the huts, took all the crops. And where they went, and this is you know, the work, uh, the insight comes from Cantor Brown Jr., the historian who recognized where they went was Angola and because of these waves of refugees from these other military engagements, Angola ended up having about 700 people wow. living uh, strewn from the Manitou River all the way down to Sarasota Bay. And so that's really the next part of our story. And that's where this all started, the, my own in, engagement with uh, excavations in Bradenton for Angola. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's such an incredible story. Um, Diana, can you, can you tell me how, for, for just for this virtual landscape, how long did it actually take you to, to create this? Oh, goodness. Um, gosh, I mean, a few weeks, really, but there was a lot of, which I really appreciated um, the back and forth uh, with Uzi's expertise. And, you know, he knew exactly what should go where and his interpretation really came through in all this. But yeah, a few weeks, at least. And, and this was all like, so what we're looking at in terms of um, the, the height of the walls and the shape of the buildings, this is all based on both the historical record as well as the archaeology? Well, I would say this is a model to be tested, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That uh, if, I was to, if I was just to write about it, uh, it would play out a certain way with interpretations. And mostly, you know, one learns in academia how to write with authority. Uh, this... This was an experiment. Uh, again, it, it wouldn't have happened without Diana and Ed at all. Uh, but that I wanted to put forward. And when we first showed it, uh, Ed joined me and Vicki Oldham in Apalachicola in uh, July of uh, 2016. And there were some who argued that we got both details wrong. Uh, one person argued it was too big. 
uh, that the fault was actually much smaller, but that was an argument I, I think I won. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think that was, you know, it's just that it's, you know, the overwhelming racism uh, in the historical imagination. Some African Americans have smaller things. No, this was a large scale endeavor, and that's what you're, you're seeing by walking around. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see uh, these ideas tested. I would be happy to be proven wrong about details. And part of the reason for putting this forward is to kind of say, hey, check it out. Let's not just, you know, look at the same archival material again and again. Let's actually go do some more excavations and see if this holds up or not. Right. Hopefully build a better model in the future. Yeah. I mean, and it really is. Uh, I mean, I'm not aware of any other um, virtual landscape. I'm sure there are others out there, but this is the one that I that I know about. And obviously based on some of the uh, stream chat of this, others didn't know about this too. So it's great that people are learning about it and that yeah. it was done so long ago. And so we're, we're about about almost halfway through. So Tristan, let's um, let's transition over to Angola. And while we do that, Diana, uh, obviously, you know, you worked on um, both of these landscapes that were uh, the, the one that we just looked at and the next one we're going to examine too. What what are some of the other projects that that you've done in the past and maybe some things that you're currently working on? Oh, goodness. Um, well, of note, I would say that one that's um, well, two that are ongoing right now. Uh, one is Rosewood in Interactive History. I am volunteering my time. This is my husband's work. He's been, he did this for his PhD and I'm helping him create, it's the entire town. Um, I forget how many acres it is, but it's, I mean, enormous. And there's also more interactivity in that one where you can like click on structures and actually learn about the people who lived in, you know, the houses and what happened to them and that sort of thing. Uh, there's also, gosh, did recently at Seniori Cemetery, which is, so on the west coast of Florida, there is Cedar Key, mm -hmm. it's kind of in the center part, and just off of the coast there is an island called Seniori, and there I reconstructed a cemetery. This town was wiped out after a hurricane in, oh gosh, I hope I get the date right, 1896, I believe. Okay. And... I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that I've been working on uh, using photogrammetry or interpretive, or truly interpretive um, virtual worlds such as these. Great. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about photogrammetry. Did you incorporate uh, photogrammetry in any, in any of this? And then if not, are some of the other projects you're working on, does it incorporate that at all? Right. Uh, there's not any photogrammetry in this one that I recall. Um, but certainly in some recent ones, um, mostly cemeteries have involved photogrammetry, the, the reconstructions of cemeteries. Right, and can you tell us what that is for people who don't know? <laughs> so that is effectively creating 3D models using a series of photographs. You you know go around and around and around. You like, can have hundreds of photographs. And then there's some software that will actually use algorithms to compile them and determine their spatial relationship to each other. And it creates 3D models with some a little bit of effort. <laughs> right. And and they my understanding is that, you know, of course they can be pretty small, like you know, models of artifacts, like small artifacts, but also quite large in terms of like buildings and structures. Absolutely. So yeah, it could function as a replacement for a 3D scanner. And in fact, uh, I think Accuracy wise, they're more or less comparable. So you Interesting. can yeah. use photogrammetry to scan structures or yeah, really small artifacts. And I'm sure it's a lot cheaper than a, like a like a laser scanner, like a terrestrial laser scanner too. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I mean, increasingly, like you could use your, your cell phone if you have a, you know, up to date smartphone, you could use that to do photogrammetry. So that's just incredible. Yeah. All right, well, um, Uzi, so we're now at uh, the site of Angola. Can you tell us um, what, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this, this was created in 2016. I had put in just uh, really a handful of excavation units on the property managed by Reflections of Manatee, which is a, a nonprofit historic preservation organization that back in uh, 1997 was formed to protect the histories by the Manatee Mineral Spring right on the south side of the Manatee River. Uh, the major interest was the early history of the village of Manatee from the 1840s through the Civil War. 
but they were incredibly gracious hosts when Vicky Oldham came up with looking for Angola and let me engage in excavations. And, um, it was limited excavations, but it provided the evidence for the early 19th century uh, occupation of the area by the Maroons. And so I wanted, to, in conjunction with the work of Jasper Clark, to use these same skill sets to figure out what is here. And what you see at, at one point, we'll get to the spring. And what you see is the water going from the spring to the Manatee River. It's a small little stream that went all the way to the Manatee River. Is this spring still on the landscape today, or is no, it? In the 19, late 20th century, it was capped. OK. And it will be uncapped soon. Uh, I'll explain that story. But yeah, uh, today, there's a big concrete cap on top of it. So it no longer flows. Uh, it's just a nice open field. There's a, a nice gazebo there that was built sometime in the mid 20th century. We had from the, even those limited excavations some evidence of post molds, and we knew from historical documentation analogies that they lived in cabins. We, we know after the destruction of this community in 1821 uh, that there were cabins and there were fields. And thanks to my, my friend and colleague, Michael Titty, who's a, a famous African-American uh, chef and culinary historian, uh, seminal pumpkins, which you see there, corn, beans. Uh, we didn't end up putting herbs in, but uh, we have some. They, these were not right by the spring, but I wanted to have a, a reasonable size landscape. So we put them there. And even the huts, it, it's probably too many huts, but we wanted to give people a sense of well-constructed buildings, right? Nothing simple. These were trained British soldiers who had engaged in two military engagements uh, with uh, the United States military at Prospect Bluff and Swanee. They had trade relations with the British uh, at the mouth of the Manatee. There probably was a trading post at what is now DeSoto National Memorial. And they had a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. because didn't want to be seen as any maroon community would try to be hidden. But so we want to give that balance between showing a robust community and a sense that, well, they were in the woods and trying to be hidden. Right behind that hut, uh, you'll see a, a rise. Until the 1930s, there was a pre Columbian mound on the property. Oh, it's wow. no longer there. It was taken down probably in the 1930s. But we put that in. And it's one of the reasons the Maroons were here the spring provide fresh water. The mound was probably large enough that you could have a good view of the Manatee River. It turns out before the Army Corps of Engineers dredged in the late 19th century, big ships could get just to this point, but not any further. So this was a good lookout station for the Maroons who were constantly worried because of what happened at Prospect Bluff that the US military ships would come towards them and try to capture them. So this tries to give a sense of people living really far south of Georgia, right? This is Bradenton, Florida, south part of Tampa Bay, trying to live in freedom and liberty after those military battles. And gosh knows what else. There's the spring itself mm -hmm. uh, and flowing down towards the Manitou River, uh, trying to give a sense of a peaceful little place. Mm -hmm. When we go into some of the huts, you'll see rifles, you'll see a uh, white plate that's pearlware. There we go. Got it right there and just trying to give a sense of a simple uh, but really uh, peaceful life that they're able to construct for themselves. Yeah, and you do, like, like the last one, you really get this sense of the size of this, uh, of this settlement. And then one thing I wanted to ask too, you mentioned um, you know, locating this. So how did, what did you do that? Was, was it, map, are there maps that have the location of the settlement there or? Oh, no, this was a tremendous set of, of challenges. Uh, when Vicki Oldham created the Looking for Angola research team, we had uh, Cantor Brown Jr. provided the archival information that said they were, they were on the Manatee River strewn out to Sarasota Bay, which is a fairly large area. And the Manatee River itself is a, a fairly long river. Most of it's covered these days by urban sprawl of Bradenton. So, it was a real set of uh, challenges. We worked here by the Manatee Mineral Spring. One, uh, because my training was in working in the Middle East, like always looking for water, fresh water. Mm -hmm. So I was excited to have a fresh water source. Uh, we knew that uh, 
people lived here in the 1840s. And again, my Middle East training teaches me that once people find a good place to live, it's because other people lived there before. Mm -hmm. Right. So the village of Manatee wasn't accidentally here. It was purposely placed on cleared lands. And it turns out that was the maroon lands. So we worked at, you know, at the Manatee Mineral Springs uh, under Reflections of Manatee. We started with, there were some SDPs done. They weren't very informative because this is that not a real good technique for this sort of archaeology. We had a donation of a radar tamponomy, a remote sensing, that gave us a sense of just how complicated three acres we were looking at were. Just tremendous amounts of material, uh, mostly from the 20th century, late 19th century, mid 19th century. And so where I excavated were areas where I didn't see anything in the top layers, where I could go fairly deep before finding anything. And I'll say, and I've said it before, uh, the ancestors were helping. We had worked with the descendant population uh, on Andros Island, the Bahamas. Local community members were really supportive of this. And that positive cooperative spirit guided us to find really good evidence. Uh, that community support ended up playing out really well. So we did this work. Uh, we presented this, uh, just like we presented the Prospect Bluff landscapes up in Apalachicola. In 2016, we presented this in Bradenton at the main public library to a, a crowd of hundreds. Uh, the local newspapers all uh, reported on it. And I gave what ended up being a series of public presentations for various organizations. And we tried to make this available and it really caught people's imagination. Uh, I was kind of ready to move on. Uh, I was rising sea levels kind of grabbed my attention as a new research project. National Park Service asked for information for the Network to Freedom. I helped contribute the content that put this on the Network to Freedom trail, uh, the Underground Railroad. And because of that extra piece in uh, 2019, we got this really interesting gossip that the entertainment district known as Riverwalk in Bradenton, which is highly successful, uh, lots of good stuff going on right on the Riverwalk in Bradenton. They were going to expand Riverwalk to the Manatee Minerals Park. They were going to uncap the spring, create a new pond, put in lagoons, all this excitement. And I had to be the one to say, uh, what's going to happen to the archaeology, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right? You all are really happy. I'm like really worried right, right now. Sure. <laughs> Thanks to a couple, I think I can even say who it was. Uh, thanks to Marion Omi and Judy Bentz, uh, who provide just excellent advice of how to approach uh, the concern. Uh, Reflections of Manatee uh, put before the city of Bradenton that if the Riverwalk was going to transform this landscape, uh, we would need to do archaeological work. And best of all, they would pay for it. Oh, great. Thanks to all the real good community support, all that good press, all these great materials, what we're seeing now, uh, the city budgeted money so they could hire a crew of 15. And last January, this is all before the pandemic, January of 2020, uh, from about five weeks, we excavated, moved a tremendous amount of dirt, uh, found lots of good materials, the lab work is just about done. I just sent the draft report to the Division of Historical Resources that's paying for the lab work uh, just today. Uh, so we have the work getting there. So I don't have the full uh, analysis ready for you all. Okay, uh, yeah, but I was coming. gonna ask, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and when we think about what you see here, right, when we were walking around Prospect Bluff, I, I said, this is kind of my image of what it would have looked like, right? what we knew, the best of our knowledge five years ago. It turns out from the excavations, this is actually pretty good. Really? We see that yeah. stream? One of the things we found as we were excavating and became a major focus was this really dark, mucky layer that had a lot of belongings, a lot of artifacts, uh, some from the mid 19th century, but many from the early 19th century, from the Angola period. And it seems like, and I had some uh, environmentalists and uh, Geologists look at this. It seems like that was the stream, and people threw things into the stream. Oh yeah, and so we wow. do have some centrifugy in the mucky waters. Uh, what and but it dried out, got buried over, 
and that's what we excavated. So this, what you see here actually probably is what it looked like and some huts around it. Did you guys find evidence for structures at all? That would we, we had lots of post molds, yeah. yeah. And we found the wow. floors. One of the more impressive things, the one really coherent thing, really impressive thing was a barrel well. Oh, wow. But, but you hear that, Diana, if we're gonna redo this, <laughs> we have to have a good barrel well come in. <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's easy for you. Yeah, one of the things <laughs> that we didn't quite understand is one, since the spring is right there, why would they have a well? Yeah. It really was uh, 10 meters away. It was not a big distance. And it seems to be from the Angola period. We're, we're still trying to figure out this trigger free, right? it's always up for debate. It's not a clear cut, but it's a really interesting kind of question right. why people would put those in. It seems like it was covered up yeah, at the destruction and we're confirming some of the dating on the artifacts we found on top. But so yeah, so a well, the post molds for the structures uh, one thing I've lots of animal bones. It's uh, it's a pretty neat collection of materials uh, for Angola, but also for the village of Manatee that came 20 years later. I wonder That's if cool. the spring was seasonal. That could explain no, the well, it's, maybe. It's it's a good question. I mean, when the village of Manatee was created in the 1840s, they chose to be in this area, and they wrote about the spring all the time. It mm -hmm. really was the center of the community, and so we have almost a continual record of the spring. And so at least at this point, you know, at, by the mid 19th century and onwards, it's always running. Mm. So it could be that something occurred that made that happen. But yeah, it's still, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, all, you all are archeologists, you can always appreciate, this is enough material to last another 15 years. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are there, are there any plans for, for I mean, I, I understand you have to do lab work and analysis, but are there any plans for like exhibiting any of this material in the local community at yeah, some I mean, point? This commit, this project has always been public facing, right? I, I, we started it back uh, when Vicki Oldham got the group together uh, in 2004 with public presentations before we did archaeology, right? To ask community members what they were interested in. And so the immediate thought with this was not uh, to just do the lab work. Reflections of Manatee has a small house museum, which is literally a, a two minute walk from here. And that's gonna be up next month, show with some of the materials that we excavated as well as nice informative signs. Great. So yeah. that, you know, obviously with the pandemic, there's limits of how many people can visit and see it, but it will be there. And next winter, uh, New College is right next to the Ringling Museum of Art. And next winter, I was invited to do a exhibit for their community gallery. So we already have two exhibits lined All right, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. So not to worry, people will see the actual we'll materials. See <laughs> yeah, people like to see the stuff for sure. Yeah. And then I, I do have a couple, one thing I noticed bet between this one and uh, the Prospect Bluff settlement is of course this one, the big difference I'm noticing is that there's no like walled in fortification here. Uh, is that, why, why was that? Why, why did they not construct some type of wall or enclosure considering that what like, they had gone through? It seems at this point they don't want to be noticed. Oh, okay. Right, so I, I, if you go to the water's edge, uh, it's actually hard to see anything from the river. I like how you're running. You're good at this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're, at a, you're at a good pace. Boy, right? And so part of this, and Ed was really good about uh, understanding this piece of it, and Van did the work so nicely, you don't see much. Mm -hmm. And that's how they hid. They, the protection was hiding. Right. And it made sense that at this point, they're really worried. But also, they're pretty far south in Spanish Florida. I assume they, they, they hoped they could be left in peace. Sure. Now, I did mention that it was destroyed in early summer 1821. So we're coming up to the 200th anniversary. Uh, as there was a raid that went down the Gulf Coast, got to this area, captured a couple of hundred people, and destroyed the cabins and field. Some escaped inland to Mineta which is part of one of the communities that takes part in the Second Seminole War. Others, though, escaped through the Everglades 
to Cape Florida, where British and Cuban fishermen helped get them to the British Bahamas. The British had promised under Lieutenant Colonel Edward uh, Nichols back in uh, the Panhandle that if they fought with the British against the United States, they would be considered British subjects and could live free in British lands. And Nichols kept his promise. They got to Andros Island, moved to the West Coast, which is still pretty inaccessible. Big ships can't get to it because of the, uh, the seabed. Uh, it's pretty far from everything. And they live there in freedom to the present day. My colleague, Rosin Howard, who was then at the University of Central Florida, did ethnographic work with the community members. And what's best about this project, we had been communicated with uh, members of the community, so they knew what we were doing and getting their support. A community member brought a dozen members of the community for a festival in the summer of 2018 for a Back to Angola festival. So descendants were able to walk over the land as we are doing now virtually, as they did in reality, uh, with ancestors of found liberty. So wow. though there's tremendous tragedies in this history, the people survived. And more and more, I'm very comfortable saying the spirits of Angola, the spirit of freedom and liberty also survived and flourished. That's such a, I mean, it's just an incredible, the whole entire story is just so amazing to me. Um, and now, and one thing that you mentioned too was, uh, and particularly for this site, that of course it's situated on, on the river, are there any concerns about um, sea level rise with this particular site, or is it? I mean, to a great extent, I believe I recovered most of what's recoverable from the archaeological site in this immediate area. Mm -hmm. As river, the plans that Riverwalk has for it has lagoons to handle rising sea levels. Oh wow! So they, they, yeah, no. So as you know, you know, anywhere in the state of Florida, anywhere in the coast, uh, our primary concern these days has to be rising sea levels. Mm -hmm. And for the Manatee River, we have that same concern. And I'll, I can also just share with you that uh, I did excavations again, very small scale, in 2008, 2009, 2013 just a few uh, excavation units. And of course we hit water, the water table in all those excavations. That's not uncommon in this part of the state. Uh, when we were doing the work this time, the water level was way higher, higher. It was January, so it wasn't the wet season, but it's not just that the sea levels are rising on the coast, they're also the aquifer is rising. Hmm. And we had to quickly get water pumps because it was much higher than I expected from the previous experience. And that was only seven years before. Wow. So yeah, no, it is again, one of the next research project uh, you know, is very much about rising sea levels. Uh, the successful Tile United helps to kind of animate that work. Mm -hmm. And the park will be built. The landscape architects are really good at that at the job. Uh, I hold off the flooding for a good 40 or 50 years. Not forever, right? At yeah. least give people uh, a few more decades before this becomes inundated, right? Wow. And you had mentioned, of course, that with the spring, when it was still, you know, a spring, that they were, you know, throwing throwing items in it for whatever reason. Uh, I assume that happened with the river as well. Has there been any underwater investigations, uh, and, and would you expect there to be any artifacts? Yeah, so people would throw, you know, use that stream to put things in, which you know makes some sense that they would just use that either by accident or on purpose. Uh, back in 2007, looking for Angola, hired Jay Kazkazi to do underwater a survey on the Manatee River, and in going through the river just at, from the Braden River to this point, so just a mile and a half that he surveyed. Uh, what he found was when the Army Corps of Engineers did their work in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the Army Corps did a really good job of dredging the bottom of the river. Oh, okay. Yeah, there really was not yeah. much there. Right, yeah. Um, and that happened, right? Dredging mm -hmm. has consequences. Right, because I know at the site of Prospect Bluff, you had mentioned the um, 
uh, the exhibit, the outdoor exhibit they have on display with with artifacts. And I one of the artifact, one of the many artifacts I remember is they had found a wooden bucket from yeah. the fortification. And I believe it was Navy divers that went went in the water. But the same thing, it, uh, that area is dredged quite a bit too from the Army Corps. So I'm sure a lot of it is maybe not uh, not around, unfortunately. Now, now Diana, so uh, how did this compare? Uh, did did you do these? two at the same time or did you do them at different times in terms uh, of reading? they were kind of done at the same time i mean worked back and forth on on each as you know we you know got feedback and just started work yeah so both at the same time more or less mm -hmm. yeah and then the feedback for for you has been all pretty much positive too um oh sorry uh yes it has and i i was meaning like uh when it was you would be like oh well actually this was here and specifically this one i do remember the um, it being hidden and that being kind of a challenge we had to keep readdressing and because obviously there's limitations for rendering that many trees but mm -hmm. yeah so stuff like that mm -hmm. Diana had a lot of patience for me <laughs> <laughs> well I imagine no. creating worlds like this you have to have a, an incredible amount of patience to do stuff like this even like one tree I don't think I could do one tree you know I mean, honestly, I, I really appreciated it because I think it's super important to have the archaeologist who's there on the ground informing mm -hmm. all of this because it is an interpretation, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's really important. So I really liked working with Uzi a lot. <laughs> and I see you even have Spanish moss in the trees, which is a really nice touch. Yeah. Yeah, we, we tried very hard to get species that were, you know, native and mm -hmm. made sense for the most part. <laughs> right. Well, mm -hmm. I, you're just missing that well. You yeah. Gotta, well, yeah, so, so it turns point. out I gave them misinformation about the palm trees. So, oh. <laughs> I've had that corrected by a, a colleague. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you can't you can't please everybody all the well, time. But right? I think again, right? If I need to bring about this, you know, and, and I'm realistic, right? My my audience in any kind of article will will number in the you know dozens, right? Most of the other scholars. Uh -huh. What this did, it does, right? It's the Paleo Vela with Time Sisters Archaeological Society, you know, our local branch of the Florida Anthropological Society, has it online. Anyone can go to the website and look at this. I always show this in my public presentations. I know others have tried to disseminate it. This allows that kind of critical engagement. And so, you know, I put more of a risk of my own scholarly uh, reputation out with this, but that's how I understand the science of this work. Right. This, uh, you know, as Diana mentioned, uh, she joins me in our anti-racism, right? We want to confront racism. We want to tell a different story, one that was try people tried to erase. And it is aggressive, but it's, it's focused on scientific methods and techniques, right? It has that balance of very political, but based on having a real close sense of the archaeological information. And I want people to confront it if the only thing we really got wrong in this is the palm tree species right <laughs> then people are yeah. good i hear you yeah <laughs> and it's such important work especially i mean it, it always has been but especially right now as more people are aware or becoming aware of it and i just wanted to mention too you know we have about uh 10 maybe a little less than 10 minutes i've got a couple comments barbara said that she's actually trying to grow some seminal pumpkins so good luck Good luck with that, Barbara. I hope it works out. You mentioned the seminal pumpkins being represented in this game. And then uh, another, we have uh, Misha says she's here. So, hey, how's it going? Glad you could join us. And if, if anybody has any questions, I mean, like I said, we only have a, a few more minutes left. But uh, if you have any questions, please just type that into the chat room. But as we kind of wrap this up, I wanted to first ask uh, Diana, is there any, any other thing you want to mention, projects, or you know, how, where people can find um, more about Digital uh, Heritage Interactive? Uh, yeah, on the website, I actually have like a portfolio of all the past, well, most of the past and current projects. It's starting to get kind of full. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, a lot of the projects have been, I mean, there's a mix of like purely mapping stuff, but the 3D reconstruction stuff is, there's a project I did with uh, Utah or in Utah, John Jarvie Ranch. Um, that was a little bit, it was very different. It was a very different experience to do that. It's more of a prototype than anything. Um, and currently I'm working on, it should be done by the summer, a project with the Cedar Key Historical Society where I am modeling the town as it was in 1920. And 
also animating storm surge because that's a huge oh. problem there on the gulf coast so um basically you'll be able to stand in town as it was and see basically a giant wave come in so a little bit frightening but <laughs> right. wow. yeah but important to see what you know to understand the impacts of you know storm surge and on how it's going to worsen with right. uh, climate change and that's such that's such an important point, and and I think it's it's one of the kind of tragedies, and maybe just human beings in general, is that especially things that t take a long time to happen, and we don't notice necessarily right away. It's easier for people to put it, you know, on the back burner or to ignore it. So it's really great to have tools where you can show people, you know, this is what it will look like in 50 or 100 years. And I think it gets the point across in terms of the urgency and what we need to do about it, um, because. Uh, it's you know like like Uzi mentioned it's it's gonna it's coming I mean it's already here but it's it's gonna get worse um, okay so and then Uzi I know you mentioned you've got so much stuff coming up particularly with with a couple museum exhibits coming up and interpretive signage any other research projects that you got coming up that you that you want to mention or that uh, people can check out and of course this tragedy and survival I'll put the I'll put the link in the description of the video when we put it up on our YouTube channel I'll put all that in there. But any other any other links that you can send me and Diana, you as well, I'd be happy to put that up. Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to kind of make a plea for help. Uh, one of the things I, you know, again coming out of that experiments uh, in public archaeology, you know, a real commitment to getting information out to school kids. And that last time I came to your show uh, was to talk about the Sarasota Bay uh, video ranch and video game, right? The game video game. Uh, this is, as Diana points out, this comes out of that same technology with video games. I have some ideas, and I had a couple undergrads help me sketch out how to make this enticing for school kids. I uh, haven't been able to package that together yet. And so if anyone's listening and wants to do projects, an educational project, and have things to do, what to look for, uh, prizes, I guess, are really important. Any kind of video game. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. You gotta, you gotta, like, you know, give them something. I guess now. Yeah, I think I told you that. You know, my, my sense of video games is Pong and Face Invaders. <laughs> That's <laughs> I got <laughs> you know, before. Uh, but if someone's interested, that would be great to get that support Absolutely. and bring this even further into uh, people's consciousness. Uh, for myself, once the lab work is done, once the reports really, once we get those exhibits. Uh, and do scholarly publications. I was trying to work with some colleagues on a post, uh, coastal zone project. It's actually with uh, biologists. And what we're trying to do is find some biological indicators for climate change on the coast. And so we, uh, with a microbiologist, a uh, zoologist, a botanist, and a DIS specialist, uh, looking at some of the historic structures and seeing if is correlations with particular plants and trees, as well as uh, studies the microbes on the wood, stone, and tabby. So we just started, uh, but they're really nice uh, colleagues. So yeah, I'm looking forward to making some contributions uh, to understand climate change on the coast of Florida. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's just so always great to talk to you Uzi, and all the great things that you're involved with. It's always interesting, <laughs> no matter what you're, you're doing. You always pick that really interesting stuff. That, but that's also super important. And uh, before we just got a couple minutes, so I've, I've got a couple more comments in the stream chat. Uh, Brad says that uh, he uh, actually I have students walking through Rosewood Archaeology on Friday. I was unaware of Prospect Bluff and Goa until now. Uh, and that he's now added an announcement, so they should try it out. Absolutely, this is I could. There's so many different applications for this uh, beyond you know just seeing the size of it. I think there's a lot you could do here. And then Misha, Misha says that her big dream here in Palatka is to somehow 3D scan and preserve our huge collection of Victorian homes. We're losing them quite fast. Uh, like the first brick structure church on our oldest AA congregation. Well, I think Diana, maybe you could help out with something like that. <laughs> Sure could, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So get in contact with D uh, Digital Heritage Interactive, um, I, I hopefully, especially uh, in terms of that digital preservation is so important, and I, I hopefully there will be continue to be lots of grant money available for something like that uh, in the future. And then she also suggests that we need a five a tier five epic archaeologist armor, so then maybe that's something you could add to the video game. That's <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> 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 that's, that's fantastic. Well, um, I want to thank uh, both you and Uzi for, for 
and Tristan too for for coming on Archaeology Arcade. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Uzi. It's been so nice chatting with you, Diana. And this is such an important uh, project. And all the all the projects that you've been involved in are super awesome. And we will definitely put a link to all those projects uh, and links so people can see that on uh, um, you know sometime in the future when this is up on our YouTube channel. Um, we've got uh, I think next week we don't have an do we have an archaeology arcade schedule next week tristan i think maybe we do well i know the week after that we do but we're we're, yeah. we're trying to line up some more episodes we try to do them once a week but sometimes you know schedules don't work out we're doing a lot of site monitoring right now for our, the final big push for our sea level rise grant for the hms projects so we got about 200 sites that we got to knock out in a couple months so that's kind of keeping up us busy uh, but if to view this uh, episode and all the other content that video content from archaeology arcade and all the other stuff we've been doing too uh, you can find that on our youtube channel fpan has a youtube channel if you just go to uh, youtube.com slash florida public archaeology network all spelled out one word it will bring you to our channel and you can view all that content uh, there as well and if you want to keep up with our latest uh, events that are taking place, you can visit our website at fpan.us and check the calendar. And of course, you can always follow all of our regional social media uh, on Instagram. And I think some groups have uh, maybe Twitter and most of us have Facebooks too. And then of course, check out uh, Digital Heritage Interactive on their website. And then of course, the New College of Florida always has amazing stuff going on. Uh, no matter what, even during the pandemic. So again, thanks everybody for joining us. And then uh, hopefully we'll see some of y'all next time. And and real quick, want to add that if you uh, like this and want notifications about further Archaeology Arcade uh, stream, live streams and want to get in on the conversation, and if you, this is your first time on Twitch, you can click that follow button and you can set up notifications so you'll be notified when we are going to do more. And thanks all. Yeah, thank we'll you see you very later. much. Really enjoyed this. Stay yeah, thank healthy. you. You bet. Yeah, thank you so much.